we are going to talk about uh, two uh, techniques for process analysis, uh, queuing analysis and simulation. Uh, to put it into context, we are in the business process, business process life cycle, we are in the process analysis phase, uh, as we did in the last two weeks. This is the third and last uh, lecture in the series about process analysis. Next week we will be moving to process redesign. We have seen until now uh, a range of process analysis techniques uh, ranging from quantitative analysis techniques like value added analysis or root cause analysis. And uh, uh, last week we talked about quantitative flow analysis, which is essentially about taking a process model and collecting data about the execution times, costs, or error rates of the activities in the process and trying from there to estimate the uh, 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 corresponding times and costs at the process level. How, however, process analysis has, fl quantitative flow analysis as we saw it last week, has a very strong limitation. Is that it, it is focused on analyzing the situation of the process at a given snapshot in time. So you can, you can take uh, one day of work with a certain amount of people working and you can go and do quantitative process analysis and you will get some results. You will say the average execution time of the, of the process is this one. The average waiting time is that one. The cycle time efficiency is that one. But the next day, if you have like three people sick and two more people who came back from their sick leave, then the situation might be different, right? So what we need is a tool that allows us to uh, that is parameterized by the resources that we can say like if we add more people if we remove people or if the execution time of an activity decreases or increases what is going to be the effect and from the perspective of analy analyzing uh, a, or acquiring IT solutions to automate the process this is very important because these tools we are going to see today are going to allow us to quantify the benefits of for example, uh, improving an information system to make the work of people faster. So if, if I have a person who, with the current system, has to do a task and it takes them five minutes per case to do it, and I ask myself the question, if I develop a new system, I will automate part of the work and I will reduce that time from five minutes to two minutes, I would like to know what is the impact on the waiting time of my customers. And I would like then from there to know whether you know it's worth doing it, you know, whether it's worth doing the investment of reducing the you know doing an IT investment to reduce the execution time of a task from one minute to two minutes. And these two techniques we're going to see today, queuing analysis and simulation, are going to allow us to address those questions. Particularly simulation, which is the most versatile or the most powerful of these techniques in terms of its flexibility. Let's start with queuing analysis. So in queuing analysis, we are interested essentially in, uh, as the name says, is the study of queues. Uh, we are interested in knowing what is going to be the length of a queue on average in a given system, or what is going to be the waiting time of a queue. Right? And you can think of physical queues to begin with, like the queue to get treated as an, as an emergency room in a hospital or the queue to get into served at a bank, uh, 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 at a bank by a bank teller. Uh, but it can be like uh, more, um, can be more abstract notions of queue, you know, any queue of work or buffer of work that you have in a system. Like in a pharmacy prescription uh, process, there are in principle very little queues. Customers arrive, take their medicine and say, I'll be here at 5 p.m., right? But implicitly, what happens then is that the prescription is put into a box. What's happened is that the prescription is waiting to be served. So you can think of the prescription as being in a queue. And there are people in the pharmacy, the technicians and the pharmacists, who are, we are going to call it in queue in theory, the servers. They are the ones who perform work. Uh, we call them in business process management resources. They are the ones who you know, perform activities. And these people are going to be taking prescriptions and doing work with them, like entering the prescription data, doing the dirt check, calling the doctor in case there is a problem with the dirt check, 
you know, checking the, the insurance, calling the insurance in case there is some doubt about the insurance policy and whether it covers a particular type of medicine or not, right? So there's going to be work and there are going to be servers that are going to be doing this work. And we want to, with these techniques like queuing analysis, what we want is to estimate what will be the waiting times of, of these prescriptions uh, given the execution times of the tasks and the number of people who can perform those tasks, meaning the number of technicians and the number of pharmacists. I'm going to take this example taken from another book on business process management by, by Laguna and Mark Lund called uh, a Emergency Room at a Hospital. And the idea is that patients arrive by ambulance, there is always one doctor on duty, uh, and therefore when there are too many people, there is a queue of people to be served by the doctor at the emergency room. And what Q analysis allows to, to tell us, is to, to, uh, to, to estimate, is what will be the waiting time of a person in the emergency room on average. And from there, we can answer questions like, is it worth putting a second doctor? Or what are the trade-offs of doing it? Is it necessary, actually, whether is it worth? Probably it is worth, but, you know, is it necessary to do it? Right. Now, to understand how Q theory starts, it works, we have to understand the fundamentals of waiting. Why is it that we wait? Why is it that there is waiting? Okay. Usually, the waiting does not really happen because there is not enough capacity in theory. Right? <laughs> Let me explain. Um, I am a doctor and I have a doctor's cabinet. And I handle patients and on average, every patient takes me 10 minutes. Right? Including the time to open the door, greet them, close the door. Right? So I can, I'll make it 12, uh, so that, you know, time to go to a toilet is included, right? In between two, two, two and to wash my hands after the toilet, right? Okay. Uh, so 12. So I can handle 60, in 60 minutes, meaning one hour, I can handle five patients. In a shift of four hours, I can handle 20 patients. No, 16 patients. Sorry, 20 patients. I can handle 20 patients in a in a you know shift in theory, right? Now I can handle 20 patient, patients and cause no waiting times if only everything happened exactly as you know in an ideal world, which is that one patient arrives, I treat them for 12 minutes, and then exactly then the next patient arrives, I treat them for 12 minutes. Exactly then the next patient arrives, I treat them for 12 minutes. Right. But see, some people are late, right? It happens everywhere, right? Not in this course, of course. So, uh, so the, the, the first uh, person arrived and uh, uh, they, I treated them for 12 minutes. But the second person was not there when I finished treating the first one. So I had an idle time. As a, as a doctor, I had an idle time of three minutes, okay? Where I profited to make a call, you know, to my family, right? But as a result of that, I'm three minutes day late for the remaining of my life. You know, every time you have an idle time, tell yourself, like, if I don't use these five minutes, I'll be five minutes late for the rest of my life until I die, right? Okay. That was just a philosophical consideration. Uh, don't take it too seriously. So, uh, so then I, I take the other patient, and, uh, and then I finish with them. And what happens is that I take 12 minutes with the second patient, but I had 12 minutes plus 3 minutes idle time plus 12 minutes, that's 27 minutes. And my third patient is a, arrives just on time at 24 minutes. And he has to wait 3 minutes, right? And, and if in addition I do not make my appointments precisely, but I just tell people, come between one and two, right? You know, which, because some people need some flexibility, okay? Like, come during your lunch break between one and two and we'll handle you, right? So, so what is going to happen if you, if, if you don't have these regular intervals, if you don't enforce the regular intervals, which is the case in many real life situations, like when you go to the post office, the post office doesn't tell you you have to come at 12.24 to get served. You come when you want, right? So in that case, what's going to happen is that the people 
are not going to arrive at regular intervals so that you can serve them with zero idle time and with zero waiting time. What is going to happen is that people are not going to arrive for two hours between 10 and 12. And suddenly, boom, they are going to arrive um, uh, all between 12 and 2. You know, because that's the lunch break. and That's when they rush to the post office to pick up some registered post letter they have. So what I'm going to have is something called burstiness. Uh, but burstiness causes interferences between the jobs because I was idle for like half an hour and then suddenly I have like six jobs to handle. So the jobs are interfering with one another relative to this situation where they were not interfering, they were very, very nicely lined up. Huh? So jobs start interfering and this job interference is what one of the causes of delays. This burst of traffic causes delays, right? There's a second cause of delays, which is variations in the job size. If I tell you I treat one patient on average in 12 minutes, it doesn't mean that every patient I treat is in 12 minutes, right? Some patients arrive and they have a flu. You have a flu, fine, take a Panadol, come back in one week time if you still have a flu, okay? That's five minutes. And some patients come with three arms broken and, you know, who God knows what. And then it's like one hour, right? Until I say I give up, you go to the hospital because I cannot handle it. Right. So, so there is a lot of variation in the, in the job size. And variation in the job size causes interference. Even if people arrive like nicely at their appointment time to my cabinet, so 10, 10, 12, 10, 24, 10, 36, it might happen that the first person who arrived well, really had something bad and it took me 20 minutes to treat them. So I went with that person from 10 to 10, 20. The second person arrived at 10, 12. They had to wait eight minutes, all right? It's waiting time. Because the jobs, the two jobs interfere because one job was larger than the other. Yet, the average is still 12 minutes. Like some jobs are 20, some jobs are 5, uh, other jobs are 12, and on average they're, they're all 12. Huh? The, the ones 20 minutes are rare. So, so on average they're all 12. So the average is still 12, but there is a variability. And the more there is variability, the more I'm going to have interference between jobs and the more we're going to have waiting time. So you see there's two factors inter intervening in, in, in waiting times. There's the variability in job sizes. And this is the irregularity of arrivals of jobs. Jobs arrive bursty, in a bursty way, and uh, they have different durations. So even if, in theory, I can handle a bunch of jobs with a certain amount of resources, I, it might be that I need to have more resources, like spare capacity, so that I can handle the jobs. And the, and the whole art of operations management is to, to, um, to find the right trade-off. How, how much spare capacity do you need to have in a given process so that you can handle all the cases with a certain waiting time, you know, keeping the waiting time at a certain level such that customers are not uh, unsatisfied, so the customers are satisfied, and yet not have too many people, you know? Because if, if I just threw like 10 doctors at it, well, of course, they could handle everybody, all, all the 20 patients, no, five patients an hour without any problem. But then, like, most of them will be doing nothing most of the time, and that costs very expensive. And, and what we're going to see has, has very important implications when you optimize information systems. Because, you know, sometimes what happens is that uh, you, you think that you have to do an improvement in an IT system because at certain points in time during the day or at certain points in time during the year, you have a burst of work and you have to handle it in a small amount of time and you wonder, should I make my information system more sophisticated so that it can automate more work? For example, I will code most, more business rules in my system so that it makes more automatic checks, right? And it's very expensive. It's an expensive investment, so it's a, it's a large investment. And, and sometimes you can make a trade-off. Maybe you don't need to make such a big investment in your IT system. Maybe you can just rearrange the work to work is distributed. Try to make like preempt work 
you know, make sure that you do work during off-peak season so that you have less work at peak time. Yeah? So that, that's why, from a perspective of business analysis, it's very important to understand these, these concepts. Uh, one last thing about job interference and what causes you is that the highest your resources are busy, the more there is going to be waiting times. Right? If I am a doctor and I know I can handle a patient in on average 12 minutes and I really take five patients an hour, that means I am at 100% capacity. 100% capacity is absolutely unstable in reality. If you, if you do that, you realize that you know, if you work from 10 to 2 p.m., you are not going to be able to serve your 5 times 4, 20 patients in those 4 hours. Things are going to drag until 3 or 4 p.m. with the last patients, with the last batch of patients, because so much waiting time will have accumulated that you, know, you will not be able to finish at 2 p.m. And moreover, your patients are going to wait a lot of time. You know, because of the reasons we saw before. So, so like, uh, this is a very important concept, resource utilization. What percentage of time your resources are actually working? Uh, if I take five patients in one hour, and on average each one, takes, each one takes me 12 minutes, it will take me 60 minutes of work time to handle them. If I take 60 minutes of work time per hour, which is 60 real minutes, my resource utilization is 60 divided by 60, which is 100%. If I say I'm only going to take three patients an hour, which I can handle in 36 minutes, and every hour only takes three, so every 60 real minutes I work 36 minutes, then my resource utilization is 36 divided by 60, which is... 60%, right? And that's a much healthier research utiliza uh, resource utilization from the perspective of waiting times. My customers are probably not going to wait a lot. In fact, what I'm going to do is probably give an appointment at the hour, at the 20 minutes, and at the 40 minutes. And because each patient takes me 12 minutes, plus minus a few minutes, I'm going to be sure that I can handle everybody. Even if somebody comes late by five minutes, I can still handle them within their 20 allotted minutes, right? But if my resource utilization is high, I, can, I don't have any um, a idle capacity to handle any job interference. Right. So we are going to try to analyze this type of systems, where you have one or many resources, which, we can, which in QE theory are called servers, and you have jobs, which are like cases in a process, you know, instances of a process, or instances of a task that need to be executed. Um, and uh, to model that, that system, I'll, I need to first decide how am I going to model the arrival rates. I cannot just say cases arrive every 12 minutes. If I have five cases an hour, I can't just say they arrive every 12 minutes. It is not true in reality, right? Some cases arrive every... Um, a, sometimes they will arrive like at the zero, at the 13, at the 15, maybe at the 29, then at the 36, then at the 50, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Some other times, there will be a big gap. You know, somebody missed their bus. Uh, they were supposed to arrive at 30, but they ended up arriving like at uh, 48, or maybe even 55. Okay, so what happened here, if you look at the inter-arrival rate, is that here was kind of fairly regular. Uh, most of the time, the waiting, the, the, in, the arrival, the inter-arrival time, we call it, the inter-arrival time between two jobs is kind of around 12, that's the average. Usually, sometimes it's even less than 12, quite often it's less than 12, but sometimes it's just wildly large. Because something went tremendously wrong. Right. Have you ever seen that before? Do you have a window that gives over a street that is reasonably busy? On well, top two, it's a bit hard to have that. Yeah, not rat to say that. 
there's nobody there, but Ria Street or something like that, you know, or Turu Street or whatever. We're going to assume that you have, you live in an apartment which has a view over Ria Street, right? Huh? And say it's at night. And on average, uh, there is one car every 10 seconds, right? But it's not like 10 seconds, 10 seconds, 10 seconds, 10 seconds, right? It's more like 2 seconds, 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 two seconds nothing. Then 20 seconds later, 2 seconds, 2 seconds. Then 10 seconds later, uh, one, one car, 2 seconds, another car, right? So, so sometimes it's very small and sometimes it's very can be very large. But not, not, it's not often that it's very large. More often it's small. And on average it's 10 seconds. Anyway, if you count it in like for one hour and saw how many cars I saw divided by the number of seconds in an hour, it will give you 10. Okay. So are we heading to a direction that uh, we have a probability of uh, uh, an event to happen? Right. Exactly, the arrival of a job. That I was going to, to 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 say what is the probability of the next job of what is the what is the probability that, that if I am at this point in time the next job will arrive in one minute, what is the probability that it will arrive in two minutes, in three minutes, in four minutes, in ten minutes, in twenty minutes, in thirty minutes? And we will see that the probability that the job arrives between zero and ten minutes ten sorry, seconds between 0 and 10 seconds is going to be high. Even like up to 15 seconds is going to be relatively high. And then it's going to drop dramatically. But there will always be a small probability that there will be no street in Rio Mante for 60 seconds. Crossing in front of you. There will always be a small probability. So the shape of this thing, if I put the 10 seconds here, this is 1, 2, 3, this is time, huh? time in seconds. And let's say that here I have 40 and it keeps going. The probability, let's say, is going to be something like 20% that it takes 10 seconds to see the next car. And there's a high probability that it is somewhere even lower than 10 seconds. A lot of probability mass on that side. There is a nice probability that it will be between 10 and 30 seconds. And then after that, maybe it's a little bit more pronounced. After that, it's going to drop dramatically. So that the probability that is 40 seconds is like 0 0.005. Very small, but still it exists. So that is called uh, an exponential distribution. It's a negative exponential distribution. And the process of the cars passing by is called a Poisson process, right? That's, that's, the, that's the term of it. And it basically, it basically just... It means that. It means that the, the, the probability follows a bit that distribution. Very likely that it's going to take less than 10 seconds, like half of the mass is before, the probability mass is before this point. Half of the probability mass is after that point. With a lot of that other half of the probability mass distributed between, let's say, 10 and 20. And very little of it, but still a fair amount of it, is like 20 or more. Right. So that is how we are going to model, you know, depend. And, and the, this probability distribution is parameterized by a, a one single parameter, which is very nice, which is the, the, the average, the mean, which we are going to call lambda. Mean is the, uh, the, the mean inter-arrival rate, like that's 10 seconds. Right? If I ask you, on average, how often there is a, the, it takes for the next car to pass, you will say 10 seconds. That's the mean. That's lambda. That's the, we also call it the, the inter-arrival time. And remember it very well because we are going to be using it in simulation as well, all over the place. In fact, we already saw it last week with little slope. Remember, the work in progress equals to lambda multiplied by the cycle time. Lambda was the, the inter-arrival time. Okay, so depending on uh, what is your lambda, the curve will look like this, or like this, or like this, you know? The, 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 the larger the lambda, the more it will flatten down. All right, so we have a system now where there is, a, their jobs arrive at a certain rate, uh, at a certain inter-arrival time. Actually, lambda is, sorry, Q 
keep this in mind. Lambda is the average number of arrivals per time unit, not the inter-arrival time, but the average number of arrivals per time unit. So uh, you pick a time unit, say it's the, the minute, and you tell me how many jobs arrive per minute? Six. That would be lambda. And all our calculations will be in minutes. Or if you take the second, you give me, I choose the second as my time unit, right? There is a car every 10 seconds, then how many cars are there per second? Zero. 0 0.1, yeah? There is a 0 0.1 imaginary car every second, you know, so that every 10 seconds there is one, right? So we we'll say zero, the lambda in that case will be 0 0.1 per second. Make sure you define, you, you get the lambda right, because uh, actually I make the mistake myself often of calling lambda the inter-arrival time, the 10 seconds, but it's not true. Lambda is the reverse of that. It's one divided by, by, by that, one divided by 10, which is 0 0.1. And it would depend on the time unit you pick. Yeah? In these problems, you always have to pick a time unit. Minutes, seconds, etc. Whatever you pick, it doesn't matter, just stick to it. Uh, the second parameter of my system is going to be the average job duration. This time it's really the average job duration. No, sorry, average, again, the mean service rate, which is the average number of jobs that I can handle in a time unit. So if I have a doctor and I can handle one patient per 12 minutes, um, my, and I pick the hour as the granularity, as the time unit, I will say that my mu, my mean, is five. Five jobs per hour. Now, if I pick the minute at, as my time unit, right? So I, ha I, I serve a patient every 12 minutes on average, and I take the minute as my time unit, I'm going to make my calculations in time in, in minutes. Then my service rate, my mean service rate mu will be 1 divided by 12, which is like 0 0.08. In other words, I treat 0 0.08 patients per minute. Right? So that in 12 minutes I treat one patient. And, you know, in the problems I'm talking about, there's only one doctor. But in reality, like in the problems of the pharmacy prescription system process, uh, you have several people several technicians and several pharmacists or you will have several doctors so another parameter of my system is the number of we're going to call it servers which is the number of resources which is the number of doctors or number of technicians the number of people say that can perform this that can give this service which could be like uh, a, dealing with a patient or serving a prescription etc right and now, the beauty of Q in theory is that if you give me these three things, lambda, mu, and c, and we make some assumptions on the system which are very reasonable, I'm going to be able to... Q in theory tells you what is the mean service rate. Well, sorry, what is the average waiting time per customer. And it also tells you what is the, uh, the average length of the queue, in case you care how many queues will be there. But if in a bank you might care, of course, because that will determine how many, how much space you need around the, the tellers. Right. Uh, in the pharmacy prescription or in a process that is handled electronically, well, in principle you don't care, except because of this Japanese guy, we saw that Taishi Ohino, who said that work in progress is waste, right? Right, so, um, so I'm going to start with lambda, the mean arrival rate, mu, the mean service rate, c, the number of servers, and with queuing theory, I'm going to calculate the waiting time in the queue, WQ, which is the waiting time in the queue. The length of the queue, L of Q, length of the queue. The entire waiting time, which is essentially the waiting time in the queue plus the amount of time people spend actually being treated, that's the total time, right? Also called cycle time. And the length of the queue, well, not the length of the queue, but the length of the entire system, meaning 
the length of the queue on average plus the number of people that are being served on average. If you have three tenors, there will be three plus the average number of people in the queue. Now, the, the, what you, I mean, you don't need to know how queuing theory works internally. You don't need to know the math of queuing theory. All you need to know is to ask yourself, is like, what are the parameters? If my parameter number of servers is one, I will use one model, which will be the MM1 queuing model. Um, well, roughly, this stands for Markovian, Markovian 1. Markovian means exponential distribution. This model works if the arrival rate follows this distribution, the jobs arrive with this kind of probability distribution, and if the service time also follows uh, that, this distribution. So, the doctor will probably be the case of that. As I said, most people just go out like in five minutes. I don't know if you have been to a doctor here. I've been there, and it's just like, oh, you have a flu, it's a virus, go back home. Right, poof, right. Try to get a Panadol out of here. Uh, sorry, try to get an antibiotics here. It's impossible, right? So they just throw you back, right? But sometimes, hasn't happened to me, you know, but maybe to some of you who have, you know, broken three arms, it, it, it's like, it takes like half an hour, one hour, right? just so that they see your arm and they say, yeah, it's pretty bad, you should go to the hospital. So, so it, it's, it's like, lots of jobs are here, but some jobs are here. The same thing with um, um, a, a mechanics at a repair, you know, car repair shop. Some cars, they just, they have, it's, it's quick to fix, it's just like, um, the driver forgot to turn the key, and that's why it was not working, right? Okay, so that was like one minute. Oh, turn the key, it works, right? Uh, but there are some cases where, gosh, what is happening with this car, you know? Or, or somebody had an accident and the car is completely destroyed. That would take like three hours. So on average, dealing with a car takes an hour. Some of them, a lot of them is actually less than an hour, like servicing, changing the oil, or changing the tires. That's pretty quick, but there are some which is like takes one full day. So, so it's negatively distributed. Grading homeworks, is it exponentially distributed? Hopefully not, right? Uh, I hope I don't spend, I mean on average, let's say I spend five minutes or 10 minutes on a homework, right? I spend 10 minutes on a homework, grading it. Hopefully, there will be no homework that will take me 60 minutes. I, I cannot see under what circumstances it will happen, right? It will typically be five minutes for those who answer everything right, and it's just like that, 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 it's all fine. And maybe 15 minutes for those who have came up with this complicated answer. I wonder, well, is this really okay, or, you know, how, how bad is it, or how good is it, right? So maybe that will take me 15 minutes. So that distribution of job duration does not follow an exponential distribution, right? What, will, what distribution will it follow? I'm saying like, this is the, the time that one job takes me. On average, it takes me 10 minutes. Majority of them, this is the number of cases that take me this amount of time, this is the histogram. Majority of them take me 10, some less than that take me 9, some take me 11, some take me 8, some take me 7, some take me this, some take me that. So that is a bell curve. Bell curve, which is which distribution, which probability distribution? Huh? No, very simple. It's much more simple. There's no bind or trine or anything. It's just so common that it has a name that refers to that. Normal. It's a normal distribution, right? This is going to be the distribution of your grades as well. Except if you are, all of you, so good that it ends up being everybody like a, like a 95, then otherwise it will be a normal distribution. Right. 
In fact, even if you are all so good that you score 95, it will still be a normal distribution, except that it will be between 94 and 96. The, the standard deviation will be small. These distributions, normal distribution is characterized actually by two parameters, the average and also another parameter called the standard deviation, which is usually called sigma, which is the some like a, 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 a measure of the variance of the width of, of this curve. Right. Backtrack. So if my a service times, my arrival, my arrival rate is exponential, Markovian. My service times, meaning the job durations, follow a Markovian distribution, exponential. And I only have one server, then I will calculate my waiting times as follows. I will start by calculating the, the resource utilization, which I'm going to call rho. Rho stands for resource, right? Resource utilization, which is essentially um, a, how many jobs, what percentage of time my servers are busy? How percentage of time the doctor is busy? If a doctor can handle uh, five patients an hour and there are uh, four patients an hour to arrive, what is the resource the, the, the resource utilization of the doctor? Four patients arrive an hour, the doctor can handle five. I can grade five assignments an hour, but I only have to grade four an hour because only four an hour arrive to my desk. And you want to know the role. How much, how busy am I? What percentage of my, of my time I am busy? 80. 80%, four divided by five. So what did I do? I take the mean arrival rate, which is like four an hour, and I divide it by the uh, mean, mean service rate, which is five an hour. So four divided by five, it gives me nicely 80%. I'm busy 80% of my time and available idle the other 20%, right? So I have to divide the, the mean service arrival rate, lambda, divided by the mean service rate, which is mu. That gives me my resource utilization. You can calculate in whatever way you want. It's just simple. It's what percentage of your time your servers are busy, period. That's all. Bottom. If the jobs arrive at all nicely on time, etc., right? what percentage of time will they be busy? And uh, um, and if I have calculated rho, I use this formula to calculate the uh, number of people on average in the cabinet, including the queue and those who are being served. This is the waiting time, total time that people spend in my cabinet, including the time they wait and the time they are being served. This is the length of the queue. You can calculate it like this, typically, or like this, if you have already calculated L, and the waiting time in the queue. So then you just apply the formulas. You, you have uh, rho, you have lambda, and you have mu, so you can easily calculate this, you can calculate that, and once you have calculated these two, you can calculate this, and you can calculate that. This is just trivial. trivial. Now, if there are not one person in the cabinet, not just one doctor in the cabinet, but let's say three or four or five doctors or even two doctors in the cabinet, it turns out I don't have, I can no longer use the, the model where there is only one server at a time. It's some technicality, but essentially you can get it is that um, the, the more you have, you have seen that, the more you have tellers, the less there will be waiting times. Uh, and it's not kind of linear. The reason is because the, the probability that all the tellers get busy at once is kind of low, lower. Whereas if you only have two tellers, the probability that they are busy is, becomes very high. So, well, roughly, like if, if, you, if, the, if there are multiple resources 
things get distributed differently than if there is a single resource. So, if my arrival rate is exponential, my service times are exponential, and I have more than two servers, I will use a slightly different formulas. I will use the, the, the resource utilization is kind of still calculated according to the same principles, but I have to take into account that I have multiple servers. So, now let me imagine I have two doctors. Two doctors. Each one can handle five patients an hour. Right? How many patients can they handle in one hour together? I have two doctors, and each of them can handle five patients in an hour. How many patients can they handle Ten. together? Ten. Ten. And, and there arrives six patients an hour. How busy are my doctors? 60%, right? I divide how many patients arrive per hour, divided by how many patients an hour can my servers handle collectively, all together. So that's the rho becomes lambda divided by the service time for one job multiplied by C, because the, ser sorry, the, the mean service rate will be five, do five patients an hour, say, but I have two doctors, so I can handle two patients an hour. So I have to multiply two times the, the service, the mean service rate for each doctor. And that gives me the total capacity. This is the total capacity. And then this is the actual utilization, how many jobs I have to handle an hour. Divide that, I get rho, and then you plug rho, you, you calculate WQ like this. Uh, sorry. Well, it's a bit of tricky because I first have to calculate for this system the length of the queue. And it turns out that the length of the queue is a bit calculated, complicated to calculate. It's roughly this thing, uh, this summation, uh, which is equal to this stuff, which is kind of complicated, that has a term P0 that is equal to this stuff, right? Okay, so, so you are not going to calculate it yourself. Uh, you are going to do one of two things. Uh, either do this, use this tool to run uh, a simulation. It will simulate a queuing system. You have to give him the, the number of servers, the, the mean service rate, the mean arrival rate, and it will simulate the system, and it will tell you this is the waiting time. Or you can download this, um, this uh, an Excel plugin uh, that you kind of install, and then it it enhances Excel with some additional functions. And if you read the user manual, there will be functions for calculating, for example, the waiting time in a system, in an MMC system, and you only have to give him again, you write in a cell what is lambda, what is mu, how many servers there are, and in another cell, you do equals to some function, so you will find the user manual of these three parameters, and that cell will tell you how many uh, it will do the calculation for you, and it will give you back how many, uh, what is the waiting time on average, the length of the queue on average, the waiting time on average, and so forth. Right? Okay. So, in essence, for NMC systems, the formulas for calculating um, a waiting times in the queue and length of the queues and length of the system and waiting time in total in the system are kind of quite complicated, so you will be using some tools to do that. Right, so what can I do with queuing theory? If I come back to my working example, I have an emergency room at a county hospital. Patients arrive in a, according to a Poisson process with a rate of uh, lambda, say, uh, two patients per hour. Okay, these are the number of patients who arrive. Uh, the doctors examine patients and treat them, and on average, a doctor can handle three patients per hour. So that's the mean service rate per hour. Note, very, very important that I pick one time unit, the hour, and I am using it consistently in, in this problem. Right? I will not mix hours with minutes. You put everything to a single time unit. It doesn't matter which time unit, wherever you prefer, but you have to put it in terms of one single time unit. And the question is, should we increase the capacity from one to two doctors? So currently we have one doctor, should we increase it to two doctors? So then we can do the queuing, the, the 
the calculations of the waiting time using these queuing models with lambda equals 2, mu equals 3, and one server, c equals to 1. And then we can redo it with lambda equals to 2, mu is equal to 3, and now c equals to 2 patients. And we will find out that the waiting time in the queue, if there is only one doctor, is 40 minutes. Now, you can imagine yourself arriving, you know, your, you know, you just got hit by a car, and you are dying. And, uh, sorry, you have to wait for 40 minutes, right? Uh, and it's incredible. If only you add one more doctor, the waiting time is reduced to 2.5 minutes. We do the same calculation with c equals to 2. So this was with c equals to 1. Same lambda, same mu. Doesn't change anything. Just add one doctor, and my waiting times were reduced dramatically. So that gives you an idea that these queues are, are definitely not linear. It's just like adding one more resources can make a huge difference sometimes. Or removing one resource can make a huge difference. And more importantly, sometimes just like improving an information system so that you can reduce the work time for each case from five minutes to three minutes, maybe by just optimizing the user interface, can solve a lot of your waiting time problems, meaning you will be able to serve customers faster. And with queuing analysis, you can calculate those waiting times, and you can use them to sort of do some analysis, and on the end, make some business case, like, yeah, it is worth doing this investment to reduce the number of uh, jobs, uh, the, the working time for each case. Or, or when you want to say, like, imagine that I, 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 um, I handle inquiries by phone or, so, or some type of application by phone, and I'm getting my call center too busy. What can I do to offload it? I can say, like, if I develop a web application that provides self-service so that people can do their applications themselves or can find the information themselves, then that will reduce the number of inquiries I get, let's say, by half. And then using these queuing models, I can determine by how much I will reduce the waiting times for the people who do have inquiries. Right? Because there are people who no matter how sophisticated you do your self-service, there will still be people who need to talk to a real person because they, have, they are in an exceptional situation. So, so you, can, you, can, you can do what-if analysis with queuing theory. You can calculate how much is the waiting time with the current situation, how much will be the waiting time if you manage to reduce the number of people who arrive per hour by creating a self-service, or if you manage to reduce the amount of time that each inquiry takes to handle, uh, let's say by 10%. You could calculate then how much that would affect the waiting time. Okay, but human theory is not a panacea, it has its drawbacks. Uh, it, is, it, it is good when you are uh, analyzing a system that is like a black box, a single task, or a single process monolithically. Uh, so, so you have the uh, you only need three parameters. You have a task, you need three parameters. How often jobs arrive, the mean service rate. How many ta executions of that task can you do per hour with one server, and how many resources you have, meaning how many servers you have to perform the task. Three parameters and you can do your calculation. It's like very convenient in that respect. Very little data is needed. But if I give you now a process that is not composed of one task, and I'm not interested in analyzing one task, but I want to analyze the entire process, and, and my process looks like this. I have one task, and then I have a choice, and here there is some parallel stuff, and there are two tasks, and here there is another task, and then they join. And maybe there is another task here, and each of these tasks, D1, D2, D3, D4, Dn, has a different service time, meaning a different, <coughs> takes a different amount of time, 
and has a different number of resources to perform, I mean, in servers, then QB theory, as I presented you, is completely useless. There are more sophisticated queuing models that can do things, but they are a little bit um, not convenient because for every problem and every configuration, you will need different formulas, and just figuring out what formulas you need for a given problem will be already quite complicated. So what do we do in, in the case when we want to analyze entire processes as opposed to analyzing just one task in the process in terms of their waiting times is that we do simulation. Um, it's very versatile and very relatively simple to use. Process simulation is a simple, is, is, is a very simple idea, is that I'm going to take my process model and I'm going to get a tool to execute it, to do as if it was being executed, and to simulate the execution of this process thousands of times. And as I'm doing that, I'm going to collect whatever statistics I want, like for example, the weight, the average weighting times, the average number of jobs that are active, meaning that the work in progress, or the length of the queue, essentially, uh, uh, the cost, uh, whatever, resource utilization, anything I want, I can calculate it by, while it is being simulated. And so it's a very versatile quantitative analysis approach. It's still quantitative analysis. That is, it's, a, it's about crunching numbers. And very important, pro simulation is very powerful, but it's also very dangerous because garbage in, garbage out. If the numbers you give for simulation are wrong, the conclusions you will get are even more wrong. Yeah. So it will magnify any uh, wrong assumptions or any inaccuracy that you have in the data. So it's like, it's like a big bazooka and you have to be careful about your, how you use it. Right. Otherwise, if you have decided to use process simulation, the procedure is kind of high level as follows. You have to, first of all, have a model of your process, say in BPMN. Right? I will start from there. And uh, the model itself is not sufficient to simulate it. Huh? Uh, why? Simple. I start a process, right? Let's say I perform task T. Oh, but how long does task T takes? I need to know that, right? So I need to know the average service time, execution time of T, and somehow its distribution, the distribution of this number. Then I get here. Which way do I go, left or right? Well, I need to have one of two things. Either some way of evaluating an expression to know whether I go left or right, or some of these probabilities of how often do I go left and how often do I go right. So I need that information. This is like for flow analysis. Then I do this two tasks in parallel. How long does T take? Uh, say 10 minutes. I need to know that. We have to give that data. But also, um, how many people are there who can perform T? Because if there is only one person versus if there are 10 people who can perform T, it's very different. So I need to know how many people perform T. So for every task, I need to know its execution time. I need to know how many people can do it. I need, for every branching, every source split, I need to know the branching probabilities, and so on. Right. So I need to take the BPMN model and start annotating it with data at each node, pretty much. And then I can get a machine to automatically do the, run the simulations. Bum, bum, bum. So step two is to <laughs> enhance the model with simulation data. And this is the most critical step because, as I said, garbage in, garbage out. You have to make sure when you are analyzing a process in a company that you know, the, the, the data you are giving for simulation is correct. Now, where can you get the data for simulation? And this is the reason why IT people are, are well-placed to, to, to do simulation models in, in companies. Where can I do the data to know how much a task takes to perform? From logs. From logs, OK? I get it from my Oracle system or from an SAP system. I get it from logs. This 
enterprise resource planning fee systems or financial <coughs> systems, etc. They kind of record a lot of stuff. If if a travel requisition or a holiday request, like a request to take holidays, needs to be approved, they will record when the person who needed to approve it uh, checked out this, this stuff and when they completed the task and they approved it, right? They will record the time when the, the request was made, you know, who made it. Uh, they will record who is involved, who is able to, 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 uh, to, to uh, uh, to do approvals, who is the one who typically does approvals, and so on. So you can gather that data and do some nice analysis and come up with the numbers that you have to put into the simulation model, right? And, and you might want to get yourself somebody who knows a little bit about statistics, because when you need to determine what is the probability distribution of a task, which is something we will need, whether it's exponential, whether it's normal, or binomial, or I don't know what, you know, it's good to take statistical package, you know, kind of SAS, for example, just plot in the numbers that you have collected from your log and try to fit a probability distribution to it. That process is called input analysis. So it's a process of, of getting data and, and crunching the data to get the numbers that you're going to put into your simulation model. Assuming you have got to that point and you have a simulation model with all the required data, then you run the simulation and then you have a bunch of outputs. For example, the duration, the histogram of durations of tasks, we are going to see some of those, cost histograms, waiting times for each activity, for the entire process, some that, etc. Resource utilization for each resources. And you will do that for the current assist situation. You will simulate the assist process with the data you collected. And you will try to validate that the numbers you got, say, for the waiting times or for the average process durations, which is cycle times, coincide with what you observe in reality. So you cross-check that the simulation is producing results, that if you go and interview people and ask them, well, is it true that on average a customer waits this amount of time, they will say, <coughs> yes, it is true. Right? So, so you, you are kind of fairly satisfied that your model is, your simulation is kind of correct. And then you will come up with ideas on how to improve the process. What if I invested into optimizing the user interface that people use for this task to reduce this execution time on average by three minutes? So you will take the same simulation model with the same data, just change five minutes by three minutes, and rerun a simulation and analyze by how much you reduce the waiting times of customers. That's the, the principle. And maybe you will try different ideas. So you will, do, you will run multiple simulations for different scenarios so that you can compare different improvement options. Right? Should I optimize the user interface here or here or here? Should I try to automate 20% of these tasks? Maybe I can if I, let's say, code, let's say, 20 or 30 business rules, which are the rules that people are using for this stuff. Then maybe I can get rid of 20% of the cases, and then the other 80% has to be handled manually. So I can do stuff like that. Now, just overview. What do you need in order to simulate a model? You need to have the process model with all the events, the tasks, the gateways, and the control flow relations. Uh, you need to have, for every task, you need to know who is able to perform it. When you model using lanes, that will typically be the lanes. So you put this lane in the clerk, that lane in the manager, or something like that. This will be, clerk and manager will be your resource classes, we call them, the roles. You have to figure out how many clerks there are, how many managers there are. That's not hard to find. You can ask people around. That's called the resource assignment. The fact that you say that this task is performed by this person, the, by this role, and the fact that you say that this role, people with this role, there are 10 of them, that is called resource assignment. I assign tasks to people or to resources in general. Then processing times, uh, per, uh, the processing times of the task. Processing times, remember, is the time that people spend actually doing this task. Not the amount of time between the moment the task is ready to be executed and the moment the task has been executed, because that includes waiting times. 
but the actual working time. So if somebody said, well, this is enter the prescription. If somebody gave the prescription to the technician, and the technician just has to enter it how much time it takes just to enter the data into the system. So that's the processing time for this task, and I will need to repeat that for every task, processing time one. Um, sometimes, in very more sophisticated simulation models, but in the, more, in the simpler simulation models, you will attach the processing time to the task. In more sophisticated resource models, you will say, task one can be performed by junior curve or senior curve. Two different, two possible roles. And if a junior curve does it, it takes 15 minutes on average. If a senior does it, it takes 10 minutes on average. So you will attach the duration, the processing time, not to the task, but to the topo task resource class. Right. In the simulation tool we are going to see, it's not possible. You can only attach one single simulation task to the tool. But if you take other simulation tools, like you know, IBM business model, web series business model, you can attach the, the processing times to the pair resource task. And you can be a little bit more fine-grained. If you want to analyze cost, how much it takes to handle one prescription, for example, then you will also uh, attach cost first to the resources. How much does a clerk earns per hour? Right? Okay, you did software economics, so you should know how to do that. Right? How to calculate the cost per hour of somebody. Right? If not, we will have software economics again in the autumn, and you are welcome to join us again. Right? Okay, so I, can, I, I need, if I want to raise the cost, I need the cost for per time unit for every resource. And then people spend a certain amount of time in the task, so the simulation engine will calculate what is the cost for every execution of every task. And from there, it will figure out what is the execution time for every case in the process, and then what is the average execution uh, cost as well. Sometimes, some tasks have an additional cost. Huh? Like, for example, if a task in a process, like in a long Loan application process involves sending a letter by register post, right? Then the cost not only includes the time of the person to prepare the letter, but also the time, the, the cost of actually sending the letter by register post, say like, you know, one euro, right? So that will be a fixed cost, we call it, attached to the task that comes in addition to the variable cost of the resource who performs the task. And we need the arrival rate of process instances, how often uh, a, 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 a new instance gets created. And, and be, be careful here. Some tools will ask you to give them the inter-arrival time, meaning there is one case every three minutes. So three is what you will enter. Some others, that's the tool we're going to use is going to be like that. Some other tools ask you like how many cases arrive per time unit, meaning like oh, 10 per hour, stuff like that. So you have to you have to read carefully what you need to enter there. So this is the arrival rate of process instances, and typically the tool will also ask you to give a probability distribution for the arrival rate. And the typical probability distribution for arrival rates will be the exponential. When you enter, by the way, the processing times for a task, um, the tool will also ask you what is the probability distribution. So if, it, if you enter 12, um, it will ask you whether it's, it's always like exactly every, it, it always takes exactly 12 seconds, or whether it's a normal distribution with a mean of 12, and then what, it will ask you what is the standard deviation, or whether it's an exponential distribution with a mean of 12. So you will have to decide whether the processing time of a task follows an exponential distribution, or a normal distribution, or maybe some other distribution. And finally, last but not least, as we saw in quantitative analysis, for every branching point, we need to know the probability of going left and the probability of going right for every XOR split and also OR split, which are the points where decisions are made. So I will take a simulation model like this one. 
right? Uh, I will define resource pools for that. In this case, I will say, for example, there are three clerks, each one with a cost of 10 per hour, and some simulation tools allow you to define also calendars, like, oh, my clerks only work eight hours per day from Monday to Friday, except on public holidays. Uh, so they, are, you can, they can handle that. Uh, or you can name your resource if you want, but typically you will just say there are three clerks, this is the cost, and this is how often they work, what is this is their timetable. And let's say the, another task is performed by a manager. I only have one manager, he costs 20 an hour, he works again eight hours per day on working days. Then for every task in the process, so I take my process and I take the task, for every task on the process I will have to say who performs it, how much time it takes to perform, and what probability I, it follows, this processing time follows. And in this example I'm taking normal distribution everywhere but you can pick exponential distributions if you think it is more appropriate. It's up to you to decide which one is more appropriate. Then I have to add the number of uh, uh, the arrival rate, say 10 applications per hour, which means one application every six minutes, right, on average. That's the arrival, the arrival rate. Uh, I will typically choose an exponential distribution for the arrival rate. And then for every gateway, I need to define the branching probabilities of that gateway. What percentage of time times I go left and what percentage of time I go right. Uh, this is fairly easy to extract from an information, from a log of an information system. And I run the simulation and it will give me the following stuff typically. First, the histogram of resource utilization. Tell me, clerks are busy 18% of the time, idle 72% of the time, <coughs> of the time. Managers are busy 50% of the time. Uh, the system is busy 50% of the time. Okay. This is actually pretty low resource utilization. Um, the cost, how much, I sp how much I spend in clerks, how much I spend in managers dealing with loan applications. Uh, and the uh, histogram of cycle time, which will tell me, in total, how many days does a given loan application take? And so I can see that generally it takes somewhere between 1 and 20 days, and it's kind of fairly evenly distributed with some peak at around 10 to 14. That gives me an idea of how much time my, my loan applications are taking to process. And if you want to dig deeper, you can get the logs of the simulation, put them in an Excel spreadsheet if it fits, and then do whatever analysis you want to do on them, you know? or write some Python scripts to handle them. There are lots of tools for process simulation. The screenshots I just showed before are made with a tool called ITP Process Modeler for Visio, which is a commercial tool. Um, one of the most sophisticated tools are ARIS, uh, an Oracle VPA, which is kind of originally based on the Aris engine, and IBM Westphere Business Modeler, which I can get for you for free if you ever want to do something uh, more serious in terms of simulation for your studies. So we have access to uh, actually all type of IBM software for free. If you ever need it, I can get it for you. Right, so in past I was we were teaching people how to do simulate. In this course, we were teaching how to use IBM Webster Business Modeler. It is, however, a very steep learning curve. And it is rather slowish. So, one day, um, I decided to offer as a master's thesis project to build a simulation from scratch, a simulator from scratch. It's, it's very simple, actually. Um, and the result is this simulation engine called BIMP, BIMP.cs.ut.e, which subsequently got plugged with Signavio. So if you go to Signavio and you take a process model, let me take this one, this is a some credit card application process, right? It's a process model, it has no simulation info. I can go to this flask symbol here and click on simulate it with BIMP. Uh, I have a, a resolution problem as usual. Uh, I need to unplug myself to solve it, I hope. It's not going to cause any problem. 
Right, so, so it sent this model to BIMP, uh, and now BIMP is very simple. It asks you all the data that you need to simulate in a single form. It's very cool, it's HTML5. Uh, so at this point, nothing is happening in the server. It just fetched a web, an HTML5 page with a bunch of JavaScript. So it was really fun coding this stuff. Um, and you choose your arrival rate, say an exponential distribution, and you say how often stuff arrives. Uh, say um, this is how how often a new how, how much time it takes for on average for the next application to arrive. Uh, so let me say that it takes two minutes. So I'll write 120 seconds. How many instances of the process you want to simulate? Well, just simulate a, a sufficiently large number, say 1,000. Um, which resources you have, say I have a clerk, uh, how many clerks do I have, three clerks, how much they cost per, per time unit, in this case per hour, 10 euros per hour, and so on. Uh, uh, how often my clerk works, Monday through Friday, 9 to 17, uh, manager works 4 per hour, 20, blah, 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 I have, let's say, two managers, and so on, right? Um, I'm not going to fill in all the data, it does take about five minutes to fill all this stuff. I'm going to instead grab an already a ready to simulate model. I have already done the job and I saved the parameters for my simulation. So I'm just going to load them into BIMP using the, the BIMP uh, normal interface. So I, I, it's just like I already entered the data. Hmm? There is a clerk, credit officer, and the system, which is an information system, uh, blah, blah, blah. For every task, check credit history, I assigned a role, and I assigned uh, an average, uh, I, a distribution for its processing times with a mean and a standard deviation. Note that for the assess application task, I chose an exponential distribution, whereas for a make credit offer, I offer I chose um, normal distribution. Why? Why an ex why an exponential distribution for assess? And why a normal distribution for say uh, check credit history? I will always choose an exponential distribution for a task that is very knowledge intensive and where the worker has to exercise a lot of discretion and apply many different rules and you know so so that some applications will be very simple to assess well yeah this application is good it has this it has this it has this this it's the income is great the credit history is great bam boom approved some others will be tricky. Well, this guy has already a mortgage and it already has a, a, a lease agreement. He has a good income, but it's an income from a company like this. He has some problems in his past credit history, but no problems in the past three years. Um, I'll give him a call and have a chat with, him, with this person to check a little bit more about their financial situation, right? Uh, or, oh, this person has a bank account. It's, nice but it's in cyprus well maybe you know we should pay a little bit of attention to this one right so some cases will take long some cases will take short right whereas something like check credit history it really means taking the details of the customer and going to some online database and making a query and finding the fork and checking it right bam very mechanic so that, uh, for that, I will take a normal distribution because it will, it will be fairly predictable how much time it will take. Now, if you have the data, then better because you can take the data, plug it into some uh, fitting system. There are, if you type online, fit a curve online, you will get some online uh, services where you can just put in the numbers, processing times that you have extracted from the logs, and it will help you to fit a normal curve or an exponential curve, and you can see how well it fits, right? You know what fitting means, right? Yeah, you, see, you, you put in the points, it draws a scatter plot, 
and it tries to find the best exponential distribution that comes as close as point as possible to all the points. And if it comes fair enough, then you say this is good. If not, then no. All right. Um, so I have entered that, and for the probability this uh, uh, XOR splits, for example, I will attach for every branch in the XOR split of this model, say the one between. Uh, a, here is an XOR split between make credit offer and notify rejection. Uh, I will say what percentage of time I make a credit offer and what percentage of time I notify a rejection. Make credit offer 20%, notify rejection 80%. And then I go down and I simulate. And it will give me, you know, standard statistics. This is cycle time of the entire process. I can see that most applications take essentially between 0 and 50 hours to do. Uh, this is the process cost. This is how busy my resource are. Clerks are busy 75%, no, 85% of their time. Credit officers are busy 88% of the time. This is a fairly busy process, relatively little slack. Rule of thumb. And 80% resource utilization is as kind of as high as you can get usually, but you know, depends. Waiting times, typically, as you can see, if I compare the cycle times and the waiting times, you can see that in this process, most of the time is spent waiting. Uh, it takes 50 working hours, but because people <laughs> spend a lot of time waiting. And some other statistics like total cost, average call duration, etc. So, for example, this is the uh, average duration for handling uh, credit card applications, 22 hours. This is the average cost, 21 euros, in terms of the time people spend uh, analyzing application, and so on. And for every task, I have some statistics about their average execution time and their average waiting time. Uh, this is in uh, minutes, which gives me an idea that this assess application is a bit of a bottleneck in this process. 30,000 minutes on average. Sounds like a lot. Right. Uh, 30 minutes. Right. And as I forgot to say, and, and by the way, once you have entered data into the form <coughs> and you simulate the model, you can download the BPMN file with simulation information here. So it will give you a .BPMN file. This .BPMN file is the same one that you initially uploaded into the tool, except that it already has the simulation data as comments inside the BPMN. So when you put it back into BIMP, the form is already filled in. So that's how I had a... I just dropped a BPMN file and uh, the, the data was already inside because I had previously entered the data manually, I simulated it, and I downloaded the .bpmn file with simulation info. And you can download a simulation report in Excel and do some additional statistics if you want with it. Um, right. That's kind of all I had to say for BIM. And that's pretty much all I wanted to say for today. Do you have any questions? <clears throat> if not, I just quickly summarize. So we saw queuing analysis, which is good at analyzing one task or one process treated as a black box at a time. Uh, if you have very simple data, average arrival rate, mean, mean, mean arrival rate, the mean service time of the task, the number of people who can perform the task, uh, those three things, you can calculate waiting times and length of the queue, and it's really cool, and you can do a lot of what-if analysis very simply. And if you want to analyze in details an entire model where there are many people, many different roles involved, and many tasks, and there are various branching probabilities, then you run a simulation, and you get even more detailed information than what you will get with a queuing model. But, you know, it's, it's like, it's an increasing level of sophistication, but it's an increasing risk that you 
you get the wrong conclusions if you don't get the data right at the start. So it, simulation is powerful, but it has to be used rigorously. And this is all I wanted to say for analysis. We kind of saw a range of techniques for analyzing processes, ranging from asking questions and classi doing classifications, like we did in value-added analysis, to collecting data and uh, doing analysis of waiting times and costs and execution times and si total cycle times and so on, everything you could imagine. Uh, and these techniques are going to allow us essentially to uh, analyze issues in the process and to determine what is the rot the, so the source of, this, of these issues and also to analyze, do what-if analysis, which means if I do a change in the process, by how much is it going to improve it in terms of some performance measure. Next week, we are going to be talking about redesigning a process. So if I have a process, how am I going to generate ideas in a structured manner in order to change the process so that I can address certain issues? Like, for example, an issue could be that the prescriptions are not ready by the nominated pickup time. I'm going to start thinking, how can I change my process to get rid of that problem or to minimize that problem. So that is process redesign. And once we have done process redesign, we will get like a 2B model and we're going to jump into the IT aspect of the problem, which is automating that 2B model using a business process management system. Right. Everything clear? So your practice session will be in half an hour and I'll see you next week. Right. Thank you.